Keith McCullough, welcome back to the Investing Summit, where I'm going to have a great discussion, I think, with my friend Daniel Lacaya. He's also an author. He's written many books that I've cited uh, and, and is also the CIO of Tresses. So thank you uh, for making some time here on this. I guess it's another big deal day uh, in Europe, or at least in the former part Absolutely. of Europe. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Always a pleasure to, to have a chat about uh, the economy and the market. So, yes, another big day of deals. Yeah. Apparent. Huh? We never know. <laughs> yeah, and that's what I want to start with, Daniel. I mean, it, like uh, I was, I was saying before we went live here. Uh, if we had this discussion live at this time on Friday, it was going to be a wonderfully huge deal, and it ends up being a hill of beans. Um, and then today, you know, equity markets apparently love the idea of a new Brexit deal being imminent. Um, so can we do that, the second one first and then come back to the, to the trade deal uh, or the lack thereof here in the U.S. would be my opinion of it. I certainly want to get your opinion on that. But on Brexit, like why, are, why is everybody all of a sudden hopped up about this and, and what, is, what is this going to look like in the best case uh, in your opinion? Well, I think that what people are getting excited about is the idea that there will be some form of agreement, uh, not a no-deal Brexit. And uh, it comes from the perception that uh, the European Union could uh, maybe uh, give a little bit of, uh, of slack to, 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 the, to the agreement, be a little bit more flexible and uh, give some kind of leeway for the backstop in Northern Ireland to, to be included in the agreement. Uh, uh, so basically, Nothing very different to what we have heard numerous times, uh, but this time, as we hear so many times in the markets recently, this time it seems to be different. Um, yeah, I don't think it is. I think that uh, the it is very it is likely that there will be some form of extension and some you know uh, uh, level of agreement, but. The problem is that if the participants in the market believe that an agreement on Brexit is going to change the macroeconomic trend of the Eurozone, then they're, they're up for a, for a big negative surprise because it has nothing to do with Brexit. Uh, it has everything to do with the decision of so many of the Eurozone countries to uh, completely abandon structural reforms when monetary policy kicked in, and obviously the, the perpetuation of the imbalances that that generated. Well, on that, I mean, it, it, it continues to amaze me that we, um, you know, people continue to look for the easy you know, one line, one sentence, one tweet solution to what's been the causal factor all along, which is the global economic cycle itself. So if we take a step back, I think that you and I were one of the few, or at least on a very shorthand, of people that started to call for Europe slowing, and then China slowing in conjunction with that, emerging markets slowing, and then lo and behold, the U.S. started to slow in the fourth quarter of last year. Um, so when we get to all these beautifully wonderful deals, whether they be U.S. deals, uh, or Brexit or the lack thereof. I mean, what what would you do anyway? Like, when you get up tomorrow yeah. morning and you have the best deals in the history of deals, I still this morning saw the German sediment numbers for October, by the way, were horrendous. Yeah. I mean, the, the numbers Absolutely. keep getting worse and worse and worse. Yeah, and, and this is critical, is that uh, in the debate, in market uh, debates, everything is driven by these sort of political catalysts. But... Uh, it all comes down to what we discussed actually in this forum uh, before, that uh, we had this fallacy of the synchronized growth and now we need to find excuses for the slowdown instead of understanding that the economic cycles are, are you know, late cycle movements and that uh, investment is not going to kick in and hiring is not going to kick in simply because there's some form of agreement uh, between the Eurozone, between the European Union and, and the UK. Because think about it from this perspective. Uh, all of the companies, all of the, uh, all of the economic agents that actually feared a uh, no Brexit deal took the investment decisions earlier in order to uh, prepare themselves for Brexit. So it is not that Brexit is going to drive those economic agents to take uh, more investment, to put 
more money into the economy is that that has already happened. You have already seen it in inventories. You have already seen it in the increase of working capital, for example, at German companies. So uh, instead of understanding that, uh, as we saw, for example, also in the US, that there was a big uh, economic driver up when ahead of tariffs, that the solution is not going to drive further investment, but actually probably just a moderation, simply pretty much what we are seeing. That is what I think is quite, uh, quite, quite interesting uh, from, from the market. But that is because nobody wants to believe that uh, the demand side policy monster mm, machine that we have seen in the last five years is not delivering the levels of growth that they expected. They need to find a culprit and the culprit here was Brexit or the trade war. But those are fake uh, catalysts, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. Uh, so how do we get how do you get a non-German recession, by the way? You know, if we look at anything that is manufacturing, industrial production, obviously the numbers are definitively recessionary. Uh, how, how, how does this not continue? Uh, and or do you think that people may not be bearish enough on what's happening in the German economy specifically right now? Mm -hmm. The reason why I think that people are not bearish enough on the German economy is because uh, the, the average analyst is not does not believe that the German economy has taken a lot of risk into the cycle. Mm. Uh, they, there's actually this, this, this idea moving around in the market that Germany has been extremely prudent, that Germany has been extremely uh, hawkish about its policy. That's absolutely incorrect. The German companies have been extremely, extremely leveraged to the cycle, have been taking a lot of risk in order to capture the growth that was coming from a recovery, a small bump, if you remember, 2017, of global trade growth. They're very export driven. So uh, they have invested a lot, a lot of work and capital build into uh, uh, increasing capacity. So the German economy has not been sort of preparing itself for a recession or being extremely aggressive about about its spending, actually the opposite. So there's no evidence that the German economy is investing less than what they need. Actually, it's uh, the opposite. And there is no evidence that the German uh, economic agents are spending less than what they need. Actually, it's the opposite. It's very evident in the banks and it's very evident in the industrial sector. So I think that that's where the market is getting it wrong. I think that the market thinks that the only reason why the German economy is slowing down and is close to recession is because of the US-China trade war and with an agreement all those exports are going to come back. <laughs> we have to remember that the German economy was already slowing down before there was any hint of a trade war. And this is something that everybody wants to ignore. It was already slowing down because of a very aggressive exposure to a cycle that was not happening or not happening to the extent that many of those economic agents expected the automotive sector, et cetera. So that would put you squarely on the bearish side of Germany. What, what else in Europe, just to round the bases, given that everybody looks to you uh, for your opinion on that, what do you think the biggest problem spot is? Uh, maybe the answer is Germany. What is the biggest problem sp spot economically in Europe today? I, I, coming to, to, to the Eurozone and, and Europe in general, Germany in itself is not a problem. It's just only a problem if you're expecting the Eurozone to grow at 2 right. or 2 and a half percent, which is impossible and was impossible in anyhow before. Um, Germany is okay, has very low unemployment, can endure the slowdown, can endure a recession. Germany doesn't have that, that big, the, the level of debt to GDP is adequate. It's high, not, it's not small, but it is, but it is adequate. Uh, so Germany is fine. Now, the problem is in the peripheral countries. The problem is in Spain, the problem is in Italy, the problem is in Portugal, Con countries that have been deemed as some form of miracle recovery in the case of Spain, in the case of Portugal, that was actually basically being extremely levered to a cycle. Mm -hmm. And uh, countries that at the same time, throughout this process of improving growth, abandoned those structural reforms that they actually implemented quite, quite uh, positively in 2012. So, uh, so if you see a, a global slowdown and you see that on one side, 
uh, the effect of technology plus the aging of the population and a slowdown in, in global trade growth. Again, not that there's not going to be global trade growth, a slowdown in that figure to 1.2%, something like that, which is the, the average of the, of the past 10 years. Um, then you have a big problem. Then you have a big problem because a lot of capacity has been built into the cycle while governments have not reduced spending, so deficits can balloon very quickly. Mm. That's, um, it's, that's, that's interesting in terms of how you, you thought, thought through that answer. On slide 77, guys, I want to get, um, get Daniel's response to this uh, because you've been writing about economic stagflation more frequently, Daniel, and I want to make sure that people understand, at least in my definition, what that would mean. Um, so, mm -hmm. on, so on the chart that I'm showing, I'm showing Eurozone CPI uh, within the next you know, two quarters basically getting a dead cat bounce. Part of that obviously is the base effects. In fact, the largest part of that is the base effects. Uh, but it's also a declining euro. Uh, at, at, what, at what point, uh, it would, A, do you, do you think that that's possible um, just to see the rate of change of inflation uh, or what's been disinflation uh, slow? And, and two, d doesn't that just perpetuate what I would call quad three? or real growth slowing? Yeah, well, it is, it is, it is extremely difficult for the Eurozone to uh, achieve the levels of inflation that the ECB is targeting for very simple reasons. We talked about aging of the population before. Consumption patterns are more conservative as the population ages, and uh, you know that, that is quite evident throughout, throughout the Eurozone. The other thing is overcapacity. That is very seldom talked about. Within the within the eurozone is that we uh, the the industrial sectors have built quite a bit of capacity to cater for the growth of China that is slowing as well. No, yep. so um, those factors are disinflationary. But at the same time, and this is this is an interesting factor that you have pointed out a few times: the difference between the the price inflation of non-replicable goods or non-tradable goods versus tradable goods. So while the CPI number of the Eurozone is very unlikely to reach 2%, it is interesting to see how in Germany, in France, in Italy, in Spain, in Portugal, you see rising demonstrations against the rising cost of living. Mm -hmm. And that's because the, the, the way that CPI is calculated is probably not because it's done uh, incorrectly or, or maybe yes, but not because it's done with, with bad intention, but definitely it is not showing the, the strain and the difficulties for the, for the average citizen to reach the end of the month uh, with uh, the average basket of goods and services that they pay. Um, so what I think is that the Eurozone might escape recession if oil prices remain extremely uh, weak, as, as we are seeing right now. It's unbelievable to anybody that with the geopolitical risks, etc., uh, we can continue to see these levels of oil prices, which shows the level of overcapacity that exists also in that market. But if we strip out that effect of low oil prices, which certainly helps the Eurozone economy, and extremely low interest rates, which obviously uh, supports government spending and, and uh, indebted economies, those two effects, you, you, you're very close to being in a stagnation mode in which inflation uh, is not at the ECB target, but is higher than GDP growth. Yeah. Yeah, what you were mentioning, that is the key point, that if you have a GDP growth of 1% and inflation of 1.5%, we're in deep trouble. Yeah, that's basically what our outlook or, as you know, it's completely data driven against the base effects. Uh, our, our Eurozone now cast for both GDP and headline inflation is just that. I mean, so we're, we actually have the same you know, setup here in the U.S., which drives people crazy because they'd, they'd prefer actually to see quad four, both inflation and growth slow at the same time because they know that coming out of that, there's something positive to do. Unless, of course, you get into quad three, which is economic stagflation or stagnation, um, the more of the of the flation part, the worse it actually gets for the people. Um, and I wonder when I look at some of these things, like uh, French consumer spending, for example. Uh, you know, in the U.S., yeah. you can't watch. I mean, literally, if you turn on uh, any of the old wall TV, radio, whatever. If you still read newspapers, God help you. But the reality is that you know people will always start what they say with the U.S. Is it? But the consumer is in great shape. 
Well, of course it is 100% of the time at the end of the cycle, which, which is why you're smiling. Everybody knows that, that does rate of change. But in, in France, it, it is not in great shape. I mean, you have, you have consumer spending levels that are bordering on going negative on a year-over-year -year basis. So what is it about the, the European consumer, particularly in some of the countries you mentioned away from Germany, um, that yeah. th like why wouldn't they go into a consumption re recession if you have stagflation or stagnation? Um, well, uh, it's, it's again, it's very likely that we see the, the, the European consumer start to react quickly. The European consumer, as you know very well, tends to uh, change it, the pattern of consumption very abruptly. And uh, it's interesting when you speak, uh, when you go around Italy, you go to Portugal, you go to, uh, to France itself, how uh, you hear suddenly that a month ago, uh, level of expenditure in some businesses was, uh, and level of sales were, were actually pretty robust. And in one month, everything has deteriorated very rapidly. <laughs> it's crazy. And then, yeah. it's, it tends to happen that way fundamentally because on the U.S. consumer is, is, is always look, watching TV and always probably watching uh, uh, messages about what is going on in the economy. But here, the economy, you don't talk about, you know, we economists don't talk until there's a full-blown crisis going on. Huh? So, so <laughs> that is likely to happen because we have already seen manufacturing indices go into contraction very quickly and the message that you probably heard as well from brokers and from investment uh, uh, analysts was uh, yes but the service side of the economy in europe is is going strong that is still strong well that we have seen in the latest data how the service side of the economy is also being affected by the manufacturing slowdown as it would have to happen, no? And uh, so it is very difficult that we see a, a, a big trend change. And especially, and here's the key, when all of the outlets, every media, every, every newspaper is saying that all of the problems come from Brexit, and then there's a solution to Brexit, and things continue to go the same way, that is when people go crazy. Yeah. That, is when people, that is when people get, oh my God, there's something really, there's something else really going on because we all thought it was going to be, you know, because of Brexit or because of no Brexit. But if that, if there is a deal and then the things continue the same way as we expect, when I, uh, then you can have a, a much more negative reaction, self-complacency. Yeah, it's 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 it's, 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 a, it's amazing uh, to watch. It's kind of sad, but at the same time, it's exciting. Uh, guys, if you throw up uh, slide twenty, slide twenty nine, you know, I think a lot of people. Uh, what I'm going to just show here, which is something that you'd have tattooed in your memory, obviously, Daniel, which is the post the Chinese <laughs> stimulus, i.e., the biggest stimulus in the history of China, and on the back end of that, we had U.S. tax reform. So what you ended up with was this epically globally synchronized recovery. Um, that it actually, it, it, it's been unlappable, you know, so in other words, why, in other words, it actually is fake news that the Chinese are able to re-stimulate against these comparisons. To me, that's yeah. the, that's the thing. And I guess yeah. anytime when I, when I think about something being the thing, I wonder if I have that, the, if, I, if I have that thing indeed wrong. Um, but, but why or where could I have that wrong? Like, is, do you see any uh, probability or, or any green shoot or whatever in China hmm. that uh, post whatever deal, just to use exactly what you just said about the Brexit deal, whatever this soybean deal is and whatever the next phase of the deal is going to be, do you see anything that is currently telling you that the Chinese demand curve is about to hook upwards? It is. I don't see anything. And the reason why I don't see anything is because the Chinese economy is being analyzed by most of the uh, of global analysts and houses uh, as an emerging economy, and it's not an emerging economy anymore. And, uh, and no, it's not just not an emerging economy, but again, we are many people continue to underestimate the uh, what overcapacity does to an economy. It makes it less dynamic, and it makes it much more uh, much more. Uh, Weak relative to uh, to the cycle. Um, um, there's also another thing is that um, in China uh, we have we 
to be a bull on China, you have to believe on two th in, in two things. You have to believe that it is true that inflation is just 3%, uh, headline CPI 1.5% uh, core inflation. Um, well, pork prices are up 69%. Uh, food prices are 12, up 12%. That is, you know, that is, that is an important uh, problem for the economy that very few people are paying attention to. The second is productivity growth. Because China, in its official figure, overestimates GDP growth and underestimates inflation, productivity growth appears monstrously higher than what it really is. Therefore, the, the, the economy is, is in, much, in a much weaker shape than what uh, the official data, uh, the official sort of GDP basically <coughs> data will tell you. So what you would need uh, for China, for uh, a change in the trade deal in, uh, with China, uh, between the U.S. and China, uh, for it to become bullish would be the following. One, you would need to believe that China in this period uh, of that we have so called trade war has been reducing overcapacity and importing less than what they needed. None of those two factors are evident in any figure. Two, you would need to believe that the companies and the economic agents in China are, have been deleveraging at the same time as increasing productivity. That is not evident either. As such, it is very, very uh, difficult to believe that the trade deal between the US and China will be anything else but a zero-sum game i.e. that if there is an agreement, uh, maybe China imports a little bit more soya, a little bit more natural gas from the U.S., which means that they will import a little bit less soya from Argentina, a little bit less natural gas from Qatar or Nigeria or whatever. doesn't mean that they're going to be pumping GDP with it. So they will continue to try to export their overcapacity to the rest of the world and as such do it via competitive devaluations. Competitive devaluations so far have made the economy weaker and less productive. Uh, and uh, I find very few things that I would hang on to uh, in order to see a big boost on GDP. There's a, there's a great trend in China, which is the new economy, which is artificial intelligence, uh, technology, all of that is tremendous. But it does not offset in any shape or form the impact on the, let's say, uh, old economy, if you want to call it. Yeah, and, and you do, I mean, for those of you that don't follow Daniel on Twitter, he's an absolute must. By the way, he's the only one who's awake when I'm awake tweeting uh, at 4.30 in the morning, and that's, uh, uh, that's nice to have. It's nice to have a friend or somebody who has you believe that you're not completely crazy tweeting at that hour. Uh, but he, again, like you were tweeting about it this morning, I think the day before that, every day. If, as, long as, as long as all you did was look at the time series on demand charts like iron ore, copper, the Singaporean stock market, oh. you know, the Hang Seng for that matter, you would never be sucked into any of these headlines that we have a pending trade deal that is going to be of consequence. So that to me, like, I have a yeah. question, a simple question about that. Are you going crazy in the morning? Like, I feel like some days I'm going a little bananas. Like when I'm watching what's happening in terms of global macro markets and the U.S. equity market FOMO. Like that is making yes. me a little crazy. I'm a little crazy to begin with, but that's making me a little bit on rate of change terms crazier. I wonder yes. if you uh, if, if you share that sentiment. A little bit, of course, <laughs> because what we're seeing is this discrepancy, this this disparity between uh, earnings macro and equity markets, which is driven entirely by the massive bubble in the fixed income market and obviously the the financial repression policies of central banks but it angers sometimes that uh, that so many market to me what angers me is that so many market participants fall into the easy trap of um, uh, using the subterfuges of catalysts no? uh, that, that are going to drive equity markets higher or lower uh, I think we should be a little bit more let's say uh, Sophisticated. <laughs> sophisticated. <coughs> well, I don't yeah, because, because <laughs> to be honest, it's, it's you know, it's, 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 think about this: the the, the Chinese uh, delegation, U.S. delegation, they sit down. Phenomenal. Okay, you know, uh, 
what's the GDP of, of China? What's the GDP of the United States? How do you really believe that those two together are going to reach an agreement that is going to lift global GDP by 1%? 1%, that's what you need to get to the level at which the World Bank and the OECD and the IMF were 17 months ago. So it's, it's, it, there's no way that it's going to happen, no? So I think that, you know, we need to live to be here <laughs> sometimes. And that's why I showed this morning this, this, this chart that you were mentioning, with iron ore, copper, and, 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 and oil. If any of those factors were really a massive driving force that was going to drive uh, the economy high, uh, up by a man. We're talking 20, 30 uh, percent uh, global GDP growth estimate increases for what uh, people would need to 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 be happy with. Um, imagine where I don't know. Imagine where copper would be. Copper is a disaster. And it was the year of copper. Remember, look at this chart. This was the year of copper. This was the year in which overcapacity was going to be absorbed. This was the year in which the, uh, the level of demand would outstrip supply for the first time in seven years. This was the year for copper. Look at the chart. I mean, it tells you everything about global growth. Yeah, it's, it's sophisticated. I mean, and if, 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 I, if I had uh, your accent, once in a while I might get I might get a compliment that I'm sophisticated, but I'm really not. I think most people know. <laughs> the Canadians can't sound sophisticated. We just can't. We're not, uh, we're just not, we get put in the other bucket no matter what we say. Um, so the best I can do is not sound totally crazy. Um, but this chart to me, Daniel, that I'm going to show you one more on this, on slide 55, just because you mentioned it in our cur in current macro deck. So this shows you on the left side what you just said. Okay, what has been the 2020 global GDP revision to the downside? Obviously, by the time the Fed and the IMF and everybody else figure this out, people are going to be like, okay, it could be priced in. What's not priced in is on the right side of that chart. To me, this is basically showing you the next 12 months of earnings revisions for the S&P 500 versus the Russell, Daniel. I mean, you talk about FOMO. I mean, that black line deviating from the, from the gray line, which is the Russell, the, the Russell's been pounded, right? It's down 15% versus where you could have bought it uh, at the peak of the U.S. cycle last year. But the S&P 500, man, they, they, just, they, they refuse to take down the forward outlook on earnings as the earnings are coming in now negative on a year-over-year basis. To me, that's the one thing where I sound less crazy, and within the paradigm of sounding non-sophisticated but potentially crazy, that's where, I, <laughs> that, that's where when I meet with institutional subscribers, who are obviously not crazy, especially if they're paying us. You know, they will look at me and say, "Wow, now I hear you, brother." You know, this yeah. is they actually because there so many of them are bottom-up investors, whether it be credit or equity. If if I, if I am right, if we're right, and earnings are down five to eight percent year over year uh, in this in this current quarter, then they'll start to agree with it. Now, I wonder if that's really all that the street needs to see is the absolute negativity of earnings and the absolute negative year-over-year -year revisions to CapEx, et cetera. Do they need to see that and then they'll stop looking for the next tweet? Mm, I, I, would, I would add one thing. I think that when you, when you speak with people who are very bullish, the, the most cyclical part of the S&P 500, they hear all those arguments and they say, yes, but buybacks. Okay, but let's think about buybacks because buybacks are actually yep. offsetting all those negatives. I think that what we probably would need to start to see and what might start to happen uh, as cash flow generation or debt requirements change um, is that the buyback uh, uh, programs start to slow down, not, not, not stop them, slow down, no? Because so far, uh, EPS revisions uh, become less of a problem for many of the investors when that the, when when you have the buybacks offsetting the organic growth. No, mm -hmm. so I think that is five hundred the Russell. A lot of it is explained by two things. One, obviously, technology, technology companies, and that is. Uh, uh, I would say very much uh, a direct correlation with a falling 10-year yield. They're very interest interest rate driven, very bond yield driven, uh, and buybacks. So I think that that we would need to probably see some change in the buyback um, right. uh, time frame. Uh, 
uh, for people to start to get nervous because valuations are not there to help you. So mm -hmm. if, if uh, we're always expecting, remember last year, last year a lot of us were saying, ooh, the buyback, uh, you know, the buyback um, uh, craziness is, is starting to reach a peak. Hmm? Mm -hmm. It's reached another peak. <laughs> yeah. So what, what we need to see is probably that peak starting just, just, just you know, a little bit of a, of, of a slowdown. Yeah, I mean, guys, just slow uh, shows slide 73 in the current macro deck. I mean, buybacks are pro-cyclical. So when earnings growth Absolutely. hit their peak, which we're yeah. highlighting here, uh, the peak growth rate was Q2 and Q3 of last year, CapEx and, and buybacks hit their peak. They have excess cash flow. That's what companies are supposed to do. People can get upset about it or not. Actually, buybacks weren't general. I mean, there's some that were funded with debt, but a lot of them were funded with pro-cyclical profit growth. So again, that's the whole point. So when that number goes negative year over year, which by the way, it already is for the current quarter, that's where you can see um, relative to the amount of companies that have reported, uh, you look at that uh, versus Bloomberg estimate. Uh, again, you, you, you go to your board meeting and you're like, okay, look, now our profits are negative year over year. We, can't, we don't have as much cash flow to buy back the stock. So I think that you know, people will figure that out as they do all cycles, that buybacks are pro-cyclical. Obviously, at the end of 08 and at the beginning of 09, nobody was buying back their stock anymore at the best prices they could have possibly bought them. Um, but again, people forget unless they've dealt with cycles. Uh, I digress on that. I want to get to some questions we have about uh, just inside of 14 minutes here on questions and, and, and please fire them in the queue uh, for Daniel um, and I'll, I'll just start asking them away here. Um, Daniel, how do you think about French debt increases in the last few years and how that affects the political forces in the Eurozone? Uh, debt increases in, the, in, in France. Yep. <laughs> Obviously, you cannot expect France to, uh, to look uh, to have a balanced budget or to reduce, has not had a balanced budget since the uh, early 70s, if I'm not wrong. Huh? Mm -hmm. And it's a country in which there is no political force, be it the radical Le Pen or anybody else, that has any other program than to increase public expenditure. Macron arrived with a few ideas of, uh, of reforms, but he is basically doing exactly the same thing. So. Um, you cannot expect the the French uh, government to take drastic actions on the debt, and definitely, uh, uh, when the ECB is extremely dovish and is likely to punch that, it is very very unlikely that uh, they will do anything else but try to increase uh, uh, deficit spending in order to, quote-unquote, achieve growth. Well, the French economy has been on deficit spending mode since the early 70s, three decades, uh, and is already three decades in, 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 in stagnation, no? So I would not expect uh, a lot. Therefore, <coughs> com sorry, compared to other economies, it is very likely that the French sovereign bonds continue to perform better yeah. because like the German bond, it is uh, sort of safe in the context. You see yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Even, even though the fundamentals are not improving, uh, uh, the reality is that it will, it, it is very, very likely to continue to be a bond that is a, 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 a better collapse their ones. Mm -hmm. And obviously, considering the, the new program of the ECB, the new 20 billion a month uh, repurchase program plus the maturity uh, repurchase, uh, the other problem is that there is likely to be not enough supply of those bonds, mm -hmm, even for collateral. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. All right, um, this one. So, and, and the question is just assuming that, uh, God forbid, you and I are right. Uh, if a trade deal with China and the USA is not going to have a large impact, based on what you guys are saying, uh, how can we avoid? How can we basically not avoid a global recession, or are we headed into more of a stagnation, stagnation, stagflation type of a setup anyway? Yeah, I, 
I personally believe we're we're close. We're more likely to move into a stagnation, stagflation process yep. than a recession. In in the way that we remember it, 2008 style, 2001 style, and the reason for it is that when every single government and every single central bank in the world has uh, a joint objective, which is pain, they will avoid the pain. Huh? And they will accept a Japan style stagnation in exchange of uh, uh, something that is not going to be as, let's say, dramatic mm -hmm, as the 2008 style uh, crisis. Also, we have to remember that in this environment, the biggest bubble is not on uh, housing or on, uh, uh, let's say, assets that are owned by the private sector. The biggest bubble is in sovereign bonds. Mm? Yep. And when the, the bubble is in sovereign bonds, it doesn't explode the same way as in it is owned by the private sector. Well, I think a, a lot of people struggle with that. First of all, they struggle with the answer to the question because everyone uh, struggles with the basic reality that they think that they need to have a recession to fear uh, risk or whatever they define as that. That's obviously nonsensical. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if all you had right was growth slowing globally without a recession, you would have bought sovereign bonds globally and, and owned them into their all-time bubble highs. So, I mean, there are plenty of moves to be made here, obviously, in rate of change terms, but I would, I'd agree. I mean, our model is actually not calling for U.S. recession, never has. It's just called for rotations in your sector styles, your asset allocations, yeah. and that's really what you really need to get right here if you're an investor in the yeah. modern era that uh, didn't just figure out that the internet came to be in the last 10 years. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, the next question, this is, even if, all, this is a good question, um, because this is, a, it's, it's actually quite, quite simple. Even if all the tariffs were dropped, Daniel, and, re and we reverted back to where we were before we even had this uh, tariff war, you know, what would your forecast for growth or GDP be? Would it make any difference? I have not heard one person quantify that even with a grease pencil estimate. Oh, it, I, 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 it obviously is very difficult and it's not good to make counterfactual uh, <laughs> assessments of what would have happened. Yeah. But we can very easily say <clears throat> that when the IMF and the OECD had expectations of 3.8, 3.7% uh, global growth, that was overestimated by about... Uh, mm, 0.8, 0.9%. No, so uh, the the tariff war, in my in my opinion, has shaved around 0.1%, 0.2% of global growth maximum. Not a lot. Mm -hmm. um, this question here, this actually might have to do with a tweet that you had this morning or the varietal of tweets that I'll have on this topic. Uh, when they, uh, they're talking about old wall financial media report earnings. Why don't they ever show you a comparison on a year over year basis. They just use whether they beat estimates or not, showing nominal earnings versus the estimate. Why, why do they do that? Is the question. <laughs> why would you not do that? No, it's, a, it, it, it's called the sell side. It, it isn't called the sell side for anything. It's, you're selling, no? Huh? You're, it's like you have a discount on a, on a product, you're saying 50% uh, discount, and maybe you raised the price uh, before 70%. Uh, you're not going to say that you raised the price before 70%. You're just going to say that, uh, that you're, it's a 50% discount. Here, it's the same, but the opposite way. You, know? uh, you see the consensus is, is bringing down estimates, and then you bring them down enough so that co companies comfortably beat them. And therefore, it, it keeps the illusion of a bullish environment for stocks. 70% of companies have beat uh, estimates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. No, I think that that is part of the. I think is part of what we have all been seeing since the very beginning of this of the 2001 process of uh, bringing down uh, growth estimates. That at the beginning of the year, you have. Obviously, if you imagine you're a broker and you go and see your clients and they say, oh, we expect no, no earnings growth this year. <laughs> you know, don't come here and tell me this. No, come here and tell me something positive. Oh, we expect 10%. 10%, yeah. then you shave it off. 
gradually, huh? and then you bring it down a little bit, and then you beat. It's 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 good. It's 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 a game. It is. I mean, the, this morning I could hear talk about sounding sophisticated. I'm driving into work, and there's traffic because it's post Columbus Day, so it took forever. But uh, Wilfred Frost told me all clearly the uh, J.P. Morgan J.P. Morgan beat earnings. I mean, it's just like you know, if that's what really how you think about investing, and you got to listen to that, then. You know, God, God help you, is what I have to say about that. Um, here's a question. This is a one I just struggled with, actually. I messed this one up until, actually up until yesterday. It has to do with how to, to risk manage this move in the pound. Um, is, this ver- is this very recent strength in the sterling, uh, therefore likely to return to secularly weak uh, after we get through this so-called Brexit FOMO deal? Mm. In my opinion, the pound is right now discounting close to a, a worse, the worst Brexit scenario, no? So, um, the pound is likely to uh, move closer to the trend at which it has been <coughs> since, in a, it's been a very, in a very, very tight trend, hmm? tight range uh, since the referendum. I don't think it'll move a lot further from there for two reasons. One is the BOE, Bank of England monetary policy. I think that the Bank of England will continue to, uh, let's say, let the pound do what it has to do. The second is that uh, once, like it happened before, once the ECB policy is already in the um, uh, in people's expectations, the euro stops uh, stops weakening uh, relative to the pound. See what I mean? Yep. So. In my opinion, in my opinion, I think that you would be today in a in a sort of relative uh, basis. Uh, you would be better off taking a bet on the pound moving sideways rather than going down dramatically, because it's already reflected one too many times a very negative Brexit. In my opinion. Yeah, if you look at um, uh, Josephine, I don't know if you have uh, current CFTC futures and options uh, net short <laughs> positioning. That that's by the way a big deal too when when hedge funds are tapped on the shoulder or forced to cover on a short-term event that they didn't foresee coming. So um, that's, you can see under GBP, there was a significant, uh, one of the bigger net short positions out there uh, in terms of consensus. So these things get unwound quickly, and then you have to go back to some kind of a a, a rate of change uh, stabilization of of, of whatever that original move was. So so that's just something to think about. Um, Here's another, this this question says, you know, what do you think if if Powell uh, doesn't cut in October because of these trade deals? I mean, wouldn't that be something, Daniel, that we get the two most wonderfully beautiful deals in the history of bean deals and Brexit, and then Powell turns around and says, oh, I don't have to, I don't have to cut interest rates in line with Fed Fund futures expectations. Yeah, I think it's going to be very unlikely. I think that, um, <laughs> why? Because, um, because the Fed has become preemptive. The Fed is not... It's, it's, I, I, this, I remember we had this discussion as well. I expected Powell to be a lot more data driven and I expected Powell to be a lot more, uh, let's say, to, to be a lot more, not hawkish, but a lot more prudent in terms of monetary policy. We have already seen with the repo disaster that uh, uh, the, the balance sheet of the, of the Fed is going to increase anyhow. I think that. Uh, you know, I, I would find it unlikely that they, that he would not uh, cut rates, uh, considering that it is pretty evident from actually from what the Fed looks at hmm, that uh, any type of deal that is reached will not change those fundamental t- trends. Mm-hmm. No, and uh, and Powell and Powell, the Fed is looking at what the ECB has done; it's gone crazy. Huh? So. They, you know, they, they they need to be they need to be uh, taking a little bit of, uh, of of more aggressive stance. Unfortunately, in my opinion, un, un, uncalled for in my opinion. But anyway, this is what is telling us with this concept of organic growth of the balance sheet. I've never seen an organic growth of 60 billion a month. Yeah, that's uh, I agree with that. And by the way, if if the Fed fights Fed fund futures, which expect a rate cut 
and they do not cut interest rates. I, 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 I don't make this call very often, but something's going to crash. I don't know what it is, but that, that something's going to go very badly if that happens. Um, and that's part of the, the shame in all of this that we've you know, cajoled central bankers into giving us the cowbell as guarantees. I digress. I don't want to you know, waste time on that. Last question on this, um, on this Brexit again, Daniel. I had a lot of questions on this. Obviously, the expectations have changed quite a bit in the last week or two. Um, uh, question states, speaking of talking heads at CNBC, every one of them says that Brexit would be bad for the UK. I'm not sure that it would be. What do you think? I don't think that Brexit would be bad for the UK. And I you don't. don't think that Brexit... No, I don't think that Brexit would be bad for the UK, and I don't think that Brexit would be bad for the Eurozone either. I think that the dynamics of both economies are not driven by Brexit, are driven by uh, completely different uh, different, uh, different dynamics. Um, uh, let's start from what kind of Brexit. No, a Brexit, a, a Brexit in itself <clears throat> should not mean anything else that what we have already seen, the UK and the way in which the UK has been working for the past 25 years, 30 years. The UK is extremely independent. From the... The, you have tools in order to make the economy strengthen, uh, fiscal policy. Uh, it could also look towards the, uh, the, uh, the countries in the Commonwealth, Asia, the United States itself, in order to uh, cement further growth, not a need necessarily. So I don't think it's a negative, but I don't think, again, I think that the problem of what Brexit has caused is that it is shaving off potential growth because economic agents both in the in the uk and in the eurozone are deciding to stop decisions of gross capital formation or hiring because of the uncertainty but the process itself should not necessarily have to be a negative uh, the only way in which it would be a negative would be if the eurozone decided to uh, willingly harm the uk but given that 23 countries of the uh, European Union have a massive trade surplus with the UK, makes no sense to me. Uh, so I think that I'm constructive on the process. Uh, I would prefer uh, the UK to remain in the European Union, don't get me wrong, because the UK was a driving force of you know freedom and, and economic freedom within the European Union. But I don't think that the process itself is a driving factor of improvement or, uh, sorry, or, or, or worsening of either economies. Well, thank, thanks, thanks for that. On the, on the freedom part, and just to end on this, uh, you have a book coming up that's called uh, Freedom or Equality, if, I'm, uh, if I remember correctly. I have had uh, the sneak preview on that book. It's just like all your books. It's straight up the middle. And I think a lot of people are going to really, this is, I don't know if this is like your last one or if it's your first of the next many, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be a great read. I think that's coming in the new year, is it not? It's coming, yeah, it's coming pretty soon. Yeah, the book is already uh, in, uh, in the editing process and, and the publisher has everything. So it's, uh, I hope that people like it. I think it's, the way that I look at it is, uh, we, I've tried to make uh, a book that could help uh, the, the general reader uh, have a discussion. about so many of the things that are given for granted it looks like um, that's great well do I we have a problem with the, well, do we have a problem with the connection I think, no, I think we're good. I, I, I guess it's a good spot for us. We might be having a bit of a technical problem here, but uh, 
anyway, it was a great discussion. And, and I'd like to thank you again, Daniel, for, for being part of the Hedgeye Investing Summit. You're always a beauty. Everybody loves to hear your perspective from Europe. And uh, that's what I think about that. Up next, we're going to have uh, Lizanne Saunders. That'll be up in probably 10 minutes.